So let's see, let's look at this flight map again. And for those of you who've been paying attention, you know that we've been moving across the globe, but where do we go next? Sometimes a research project is so intrins intrinsically multinational that it's impossible to limit a report to a single region or a single country. And that is the case with Professor Shelley McGuire's work on human breast milk consumption. Shelley, who directs the program in Family and Computer Science, was a faculty member at Washington State University from 1995 until just a few months ago when she joined her husband and research collaborator, Mark McGuire, in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here at the University of University of Idaho, and we're so delighted to have her. So the research that Shelley is going to describe today spans four continents <coughs> and twice that many countries and is expanding even as we speak. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, and even the U.S. Department of Defense have taken an interest in the research results on human breast milk consumption. This research draws on data from all over the world and has implications for the people and communities no matter where they live. This work exemplifies the global reach of our research at the University of Idaho. So please join me in welcoming Shelley as the final speaker. Thank you very much. I know there's six minutes and 40 seconds left, so we can do this. Thank you all for being here. And I'm really excited tonight to be able to speak a little bit about our international work that we've been doing on human milk. And the title of my talk is Human Milk, Mother Nature's Quintessential Designer Food. So I thought I would start by talking about what is a designer food. What the heck does that mean anyway? Well, a designer food is some sort of food that contains a nutrient or other substance in higher amounts than normal and is thought to impart some sort of health benefit. Um, my favorite sort of uh, designer foods can be found in the dairy case where you can find any combination of products such as lactose-free, fat-free, lactose and fat-free, grass-fed and omega-3 rich milk. And to me, this seems a bit crazy because regular old cow's milk is just about as nutritious as it gets. But did you know that different mammals make milk with different compositions? These differences are thought to be driven by selective evolution over the millennia, resulting in the perfect mix of nutrients for that offspring. In this way, milk itself is a perfect example of a designer food, but in this case, the designer was mother nature, not a farmer or a food manufacturer. I need to confess that I've been interested in milk for a very long time. In fact, this picture was taken 30 years ago at our wedding reception, and yes, my husband and I toasted with milk. Um, we, this is Mark McGuire, we have been studying uh, human milk and bovine milk for uh, a very, very long time, um, and it's, it's a really fun collaboration. And in fact, this uh, topic has become even more interesting as we know that early life exposures like nutrition can affect health throughout the rest of our lives. This concept is referred to as the developmental origins of health and disease. We are especially fascinated with how variation in nutrient intake during the period of breastfeeding may, shel may help shape lifelong health. For instance, a few years ago, we conducted a study to examine whether variation in human milk composition affects inflammation. For this study, we sent human milk samples to the WCU vet school. They told us that our milk was sterile, but when we used more high-tech methods, we found that it was not sterile at all. So it turns out that what we saw depending, depended on how we looked at it. This next slide shows uh, the main findings from that study. These figures illustrate the relative amounts of various bacteria in three milk samples collected from the 16 women who participated in the study. Each color represents a particular bacterium. And you can see that each milk sample contained various types of bacteria. There was quite a bit of variability among women, but each woman's milk contained a, a relatively stable microbiome. We then began an interdisciplinary collaboration with Dr. Courtney Meehan, an anthropologist who had been studying moms and babies in the Central African Republic for decades. Together we found that the microbiomes in milk produced by women in the CAR are very different from what we find in milk produced by women living on the Palouse. That led us to the INSPIRE project, a very large study involving about 25 researchers around the globe. Those at the U of I are high highlighted here in gold. Our basic hypothesis was that normal human milk microbiome varies around the globe. This sounds like a simple hypothesis to test, but actually it was quite tricky. 
This INSPIRE project involved two U.S. cohorts, one here on the Palouse and another in California. We also had two cohorts in Ethiopia, two in the Gambia, and one each in Peru, Spain, Sweden, Ghana, and Kenya. In Ethiopia and the Gambia, we studied ethnically similar women living in ur urban and rural areas. So to rigorously test this hypothesis, we put together and shipped hundreds of sample collection kits containing all the supplies needed for all the milk and fecal collections. I'm not going to talk about that. And as to be expected, we, uh, we ran into some interesting challenges. For in instance, most of the kits we sent to Peru were confiscated by customs agents who wanted breast pump kits. I don't know. Instead, we ended up having to send them with families and friends. We also administered questionnaires assessing important variables like birthing practices, antibiotic use, maternal diet, household crowding, and the presence of farm animals in the house. We are just beginning to explore the wealth of this data. So those of you who are big data people, please come and talk to us. We have a lot of data. I'd like to show you just a few slides from, from the INSPIRE project. The first illustrates the milk microbiome in all the cohorts with Ethiopia on the last left and our local cohort on the right. As you can see, there are some commonalities like the presence of streptococcus, which is the dark orange on the bottom. Uh, that was in all the milk, but there were also noticeable differences, as you can tell here. On the following slide, I have the milk microbiomes from the two Gambian cohorts with the rural population on the left and the urban on the right. You can see that they're quite similar, which surprised us because these populations have vast differences in both lifestyle and in location. So we were surprised at this. On the next slide, however, I have the, the findings from Ethiopia, which are quite different. On the left is the rural milk microbiome, and on the right is the urban microbiome. And you can see on the left that there's a lot of red. That is rhizobium, which we consider to be a soil bacterium. And we have a couple hypotheses uh, as to why there's so much rhizobium in the milk in rural Ethiopia. One is that the women eat NSET, which is fermented in the ground. And the second is they practice um, something called pica, which means that they eat soil. So we are also finding that more intensive childcare practices, such as sleeping with the baby, are associated with the milk. Milk having more different types of bacteria in it, and also dietary patterns seem to be related to variation in milk microbiome. We've also begun to analyze our, our samples for other milk components. And here you can see milk lactose, which is generally considered to be the most stable component in milk. However, our data clearly show that there's much more variability in, in lactose than we had originally thought. And we wonder if milk lactose has been evolutionarily designed to be different in different populations. On the next slide is protein, and the line across there represents the value used around the world to set dietary recommendations for infants and to inform formula manufacturers as to how much protein they should add to their infant formulas. This value was set using protein values in the United States, which is very close to our, U our Palouse uh, values. But we're wondering, for example, if Kenyan babies need more protein. In summary, our international work strongly suggests that human milk may in fact be customized by a particular environment and culture to support well-being of infants in that environment and culture. We are currently using genome-wide association studies to help explore the possibility that selective evolution has helped shape these differences. And finally, for those of you who perhaps have not had an opportunity to work internationally, I want to encourage you to do so. Um, with the technology that we have and the ease of travel, conducting international research has never been easier. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you're interested in learning how we have pulled this off from the Palouse. Uh, we, would be we would be very happy to share our insights with you. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. You are welcome. Woohoo, a trophy. trophy. Thank you. Bathtub. Thank you. Much. Wasn't that fantastic? And, and thanks again to all. Let's give another round of applause to all of our speakers for tonight.